Okay, welcome back to the Backcountry Rookies podcast. So today we have, I'll call it an interesting show. So I have Jeff Moran on from Built for the Hunt. And you would think we would be talking about lifting weights and fitness plans and supplements and all of that kind of stuff. And we might touch on that. But that's not the focus of today's conversation. So today we're actually going to be talking about filming hunts and film tours and submitting videos to film tours, just kind of a little bit of everything. Um, Jeff, Jeff has been recording hunts for a few years, several years, and he put together a pretty kick-ass video for last year. And, and, uh, I'm going to let Jeff talk about it. So Jeff, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll, uh, we'll jump into all this. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah, we do. Um, thanks for having me on, by the way. Uh, Absolutely. My, yeah, like you, like you said, my name is Jeff Moran. I, I'm one of the two owners of, or I guess there's three of us now, of uh, Built for the Hunt or builtforthehunt.com. So primarily we're just, um, we're, we're kind of like almost like a bodybuilding.com, but for the outdoor industry. So because the outdoor, I mean, I guess the outdoorsmen, we, we kind of, take things a little bit differently and how we treat our bodies when we go into the outdoors and hunting and all that sort of stuff. So we, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of demand for products and, and plans and everything that, that meet our needs. And that's kind of where the, everything got its start. But one of my business partner, he was actually on the filming side of the hunting industry when he started. And that, that kind of led to us being, um, we wanted to branch out from just like an online based company to like into the filming. So people could actually see what we do, uh, everything from gym to nutrition, to workouts, to gear, to all the way into the actual hunts themselves and, and filming the hunts. And, and, uh, I know, I know he always had a dream. My, my business partner, Mike, he always had a dream of, of being able to submit a film to some of the big film tours and getting them accepted. And, that was something that we were able to accomplish this year. And, and then people get to watch it and they get to go online. They can jump onto our YouTube too and uh, be able to see some of the stuff that we go through. We put ourselves through to be able to, to hunt the way that we do. I know I hunt in, in territory that's a little rough and rugged. There's not very many people around there. Um, if I ever see anybody, I'm surprised. It's like more of a shock to see a, a human being back there. So yeah. That's, well, you had sent me the trailer. Nice. <laughs> you, you, you'd sent me the intro for that video that you submitted, and I was, it's beautiful out there wherever 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 you're hunting at. It's certainly <laughs> remote. That's it, for sure. It's not. It's one of those things where like, when you're there, you just like you dread it, you hate yourself, you hate, you think you're an idiot and all this other sort of stuff. And then when you get out of there, you're like, oh man, that was great. And you look back at the pictures and you're like, man, that's really a pretty place. But you, you just, you want to cuss it up and down the mountain while you're walking. And, and uh, then you realize how, how good of an accomplishment it was once you get out of there. But in the moment, it's terrible. <laughs> it's absolutely awful. But yeah. I keep doing it. So, yeah. We'll get into it. We'll, we'll dive into it a little bit more. Probably the most grueling part I'm sure is the pack out and, and we'll jump into that here, here in a little bit. There's, but, there's some stories with that one. So, yeah, well, let's talk about the filming part. So you and I, okay. we were kind of, we were BSing a little bit before the, before we started the show. Um, and you were talking about self filming and sort of the struggles and the, the pains that you can have self filming Talk about that a little bit and, and I guess talk about how, how, how difficult it can be and, and, you know, how to make yourself successful doing it if possible. You know, the self-filming thing and, and I guess it started, it started when I got my start in the industry, I, I thought, you know what, I can, I can handle this like self-filming thing. I, I'm in shape and moving around and I always have like quick releases on my pack um, and to be able to get the cameras out and whatnot. And, uh, man, I, I tried like the first couple of years and, and it was difficult. I went and bought, like, I have like, I have probably two to four cameras on me at all times. And when I was just, because I'm primarily a solo owner, I go in there by myself and trying to make sure to, to get animals on film and, and learn like the tricks of the trade and be able to do like, um, time lapses and all that sort of stuff. Because, a lot of people, when you go into it and you think about, uh, uh-oh, did I lose you? Nope, you're good. Okay. Somebody just called and I thought my phone would have stopped that. Um, 
when you go into like filming, you, you forget that there's a lot more edits and everything else that need to go into the film besides just the actual animals and just trying to get the shot on film. And so <clears throat> like, <laughs> I hate this one, but you go up and you have to like set a camera up on the side of the hill and then you got to walk back down like 30, 40, 50 yards and throw the pack back on and then walk up towards the camera and stuff like that. And it's, it, it, it gets rough and frustrating. And then, and then there comes a point where you're in the heat of the moment and you have like animals around or you're calling out or I'm mostly an elk hunter and you're trying to call bull in or something like that. And you got to set the camera up and then you got to move it again. And, and um, learning all that stuff is, well, I mean, we're hunters, so we're used to like failure. We're good at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really good at not doing well. <laughs> right. And then you get to capture it all on film. It's, it's even better. Um, I never say <laughs> failure, though. I, I always say lessons learned, right? Because <clears throat> if you fail a camera shot or you fail it, then, okay, I figured it out. I can do it next time. Now I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> well, so. I've failed a lot of them. So, yeah. But yeah, yeah there's, um, <clears throat> there's, so, so then you got to like walk back up, you got to move the camera again and, and try and get everything on the shot and, and learning. There's a lot to learn too um, about like the types of cameras you're looking for different like light exposure and everything else. And, and um, man, that first couple of years, I, I went from like handy cams to, to GoPros. I tried a, I tried a tactic cam one year and in Idaho, it's even more difficult because you can't have anything electronic on your weapon. So you can't put a camera on your bow. You can't put a camera on your rifle or anything like that. I know a lot of people will put like a GoPro on like facing them when they take a shot and you can't do any of that stuff. Hmm. Um, and so it becomes that, that adds another challenge to it. Um, and so <clears throat> there's, I've had multiple stories where I was just like inches away from getting what I needed to on camera. And then it just, something fell apart. And I had to move and I moved out of the screen and you can't, when you're by yourself, I don't know how like the, the solo hunter guys do it, to be honest with you. It's so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a mess. Uh, you brought up the solo hunter guys and Remy Warren was just on the Vortex <laughs> Nation podcast, I think. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of touching on the same topics about self-filming and just what he had to go through to learn how to be successful doing it. And it's amazing to me. I can't. I've tried to not really self film, but I've tried to do some of the pictures and things and I'll catch, I'll catch myself putting a camera in a tree and, you know, doing all kinds of different things. And then I'm like, dang it, man, I should be looking for animals, right? Like, what am I doing? And I get yeah. myself to, I talk myself out of it. And then I, I, I think I lose a, a lot of opportunities to have really cool memories or good videos or good pictures because I'll, I'll tell myself like, okay, I, I don't need to be doing this. I need to be more focused on hunting. And uh, this year I'm going to focus a little bit more on taking more pictures and, and maybe solo pictures, probably not filming, <laughs> but pictures for sure. The one thing I would give people, like if you go through and you look at my Instagram personally, there's a lot of, uh, I, I have a lot of people that'll message me and say like, man, what camera do you use? And all this other stuff for, for the photos that I get. And actually most people don't realize you can adjust your iPhone or iPhones come stock as like a 1080 camera. Um, but you can change the setting in your iPhone to 4k at like 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, most of my photos are actually screenshots of live video. And so I'll adjust the, I'll adjust the phone. I'll set it up in a tree, anything like that. And then, and then it'll take a video of whatever I have going on at the time. And then, or a GoPro, um, the new, the two new GoPros. So the hero seven black and the hero eight black are both like image stabilization, uh, 4k HD, like, uh, 120 frames per second. If I remember Holy right. Holy And are you serious? Uh huh. The, wow. the <clears throat> part of, part of my film this year that went into full draw, you'll be able to see that that we actually took GoPro footage and it's actually on there and it it looks almost, I mean, I wouldn't say it's as good as the, the bigger 4K DSLRs that we have, but it's still really high quality film. Um, and the nice thing about the 4K is compared to the old fashioned like 1080p um, cameras is you can actually blow the screen up a lot. And most, I guess most people don't realize that. So 4K is technically like 1080p times four different blocks. And so when you pull that in, you can pull it into a quarter of the size and, and blow it up. And so 
and you can actually see the animal and see the shot and everything. I, my shot on my this year was almost 60 yards and you can blow the, the GoPro film up to the point where you can see the arrow hit him. Um, where you couldn't do that in the past. You remember the old GoPro films, like uh, if an animal is at like 20 yards, he looks like he's 150 yards away in the, the video. Yeah. So, and the old GoPros uh, were really kind of, um, what do you call that, where you lose that? Fish eye? The, yeah, the fish eye and the edges. Yeah. Good. So you can, good. It's, it's, it's a little bit better now. The, I had switched to the Tacticam at one point in time because I thought that that was going to be, because the 4K was a big deal and, and the Tacticam is really difficult when you can't attach it to your weapon. It's really hard. Um, and so I had to go back to the GoPro on like, I'll, sometimes I'll mount the GoPro on my chest plate or I'll mount it over the shoulder on the, the pack. So it's looking over my, like to my side. Uh, or I'll do the, the classic head mount, which is what I did when I actually shot the animal this year. So um, <clears throat> the GoPros and, and the way that your iPhones now can record in that 4K, you can actually you can do a lot of good filming um, and take photos just from your screenshots from that stuff. So uh, we, we've done a lot. And I believe that the new GoPro Hero 8, you can, you can buy like separate lenses for it and you can get rid of that whole like fisheye look if you really need to. So it just Interesting. <clears throat> costs some money. It's not cheap, but. <laughs> well, that's... okay. So let's then, I think that's probably a good segue to talk about the different items that you do use if you're going to solo hunt and like what camera, GoPro, point and shoot, DSLR, just kind of what's in your kit. Because um, again, I think a lot of people that want to try to start self filming, they don't, they think it might just be iPhone and a GoPro and that, and they're right. going to get enough. You might get some, but I don't, I don't think you're going to get full draw film tour quality stuff that way. No, you're, you're not. And the, um, like originally when I started doing like cell film stuff, I was using a handy cam, uh, like a Sony, I can't remember. I think it was like an A53 or something like that. Um, which is just like a point and shoot handheld. That's not much bigger than your hand and it's 4k and it can zoom in a long ways and you can capture a lot. The problem that I had with it was, uh, it's, it's kind of an awkward, well, I mean, DSLRs are pretty awkward too, but being able to set it all up on a tripod and that's I, I would say that that's probably your biggest issue when you're trying to do like self-filming is, is being able to hold the can either hold the camera steady or put it on a tripod somewhere and make sure that because most of the time you're going to want to put it on a tripod and then you're going to want to get in front of the camera and then if the animal comes in I mean animals are unpredictable you don't know if they're going to come in from the left or the right or behind you or whatever and if they're out of the frame then you kind of miss it and i Remy and those guys have, have mastered it where they're able to at least like they're they're almost taking multiple cameras where they put one behind them and then they have another one that that they have right next to them and being able to have I guess the tripods are probably one of the most important like whole parts to the deal in the first place because if you have to have a tripod that folds up quietly that's quick and you can like dispatch it anywhere you need to at the spur of the moment and when you're on a steep terrain that becomes difficult um and so it's making sure that <clears throat> you pretty much have that stuff like attached at all time and ready to go i know i added like on my packs are like i make sure that i can get the, z the zippers on the top of my pack are always right there in the middle and that's where like my camera stuff is so I can reach over the top of my head and unzip things and then reach back in them because if you're in a hurry if that zipper is like all the way around to the back you're never going to get to your camera in time you got to pull your pack off and then who knows what's going to happen with the animal um do you so carry a, a um like a shoulder strap uh peak design or cotton carrier do you have anything <laughs> that keeps a camera attached to you um all the GoPro, I'll use one of their mounts um, for the most part. They have a chest plate mount and they have a, a head mount. Um, I generally don't carry a uh, a bino harness. I know some guys will be able to like hook it into their bino harness. I haven't done a whole lot of that stuff, but the reason I try to like make sure everything's up high is because in if you're trying to film something from like chest level a lot of times that's where your bow or anything else is going to be and you're not going to see very much of the whole action in the first place so yeah i mean you you finally get that shot on film and then you go through and you watch the film and you're like oh i 
I can see my bow and I can see my hand and then that's about it. And you're like, oh, <laughs> there's no animal in do? the picture. Right. No <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, Gotta. so you have to, you have to think of angles and, and a lot of it is going to be one of the things that I start doing, even with the GoPro was going in and learning the angle that I like to have the GoPro or basically hooking everything up when I would go to practice sessions and shooting the bow. So that way I could figure out what angle the GoPro always need to be at and making sure that that was locked in because if you're not, if you're not used to having that and you're not used to like how many clicks it takes to turn it on and turn it off and, and all of those other things, then, then all of a sudden the, the moment's going to come and everything's it's, it's almost like muscle memory that you get from shooting a bow or shooting a gun where you, you know, to draw back and that's your anchor point. Well, same thing goes with the GoPro and same thing goes with your other cameras is making sure that you know exactly where it's at, what angle it's supposed to be at and, and doing that, which comes a lot from practice. And most people don't even think about practicing the whole camera thing. To be oh, honest. And that's uh, you, always a valuable point. And I bring that up on this podcast a lot is that it, it whatever system, anything that you're going to use, you should try it many, many times before you take right. it out. And that exactly. goes just, just like you said, it goes with the cameras and, you know, if you have never shot with a Tacticam on your bow and then you go throwing it on the end of your bow, it may change that, you know, it, I mean, it mounts to your stabilizer, so it's going to change some of the function of the right. bow. Um, it does. And I know if you're going to do, if you're going to do those, a lot of people, you get so used to when you shoot your bow, you drop it forward and almost everybody does it. They let that bow like fall forward. Well, if you have the Tacticam on, is all you're going to do is hear the arrow leave the bow because you're going to, you're going to drop the bow forward. So you have to, you have to change how you're reacting and make sure that when you, when you shoot, you leave that bow like straight forward. Yeah. That's a and, good point. Yeah. Yeah. All so those little things. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. So I, I guess with like cell filming, if you're going to, if you're just starting out, the best thing to do is, is go find like a, a quality, like 4k um, handy cam because DSLRs are a whole new world and trying to learn interchangeable lenses, autofocus, um, image stabilization. When you get into all of that stuff, like it's like going from like basic algebra to calculus and <laughs> it's, I, it's a it whole, is, it's it a whole is, different absolutely. nightmare. <clears throat> I got a little so, point and shoot that I played around with for, for a, a while, you know, just goofing off. And then I bought a Sony mirrorless and just trying mm -hmm. to learn the manual modes. I still don't even, I'm not even that great with it, uh, but I play yeah. with it, right? I take it out a lot. I take anytime I'm going hiking or, or I, that camera's almost always with me now. And I try to learn how to do it. And the, uh, my first experience, <clears throat> my first experience, <laughs> um, shooting with a, a, a Sony, that mirrorless, the DSLR. So, I had hunted for like seven days and I had a lot of film and I do a lot of, I actually do a lot of video um, journal entries every single day. I'll sit there and I'll talk to the camera. I'll talk about what day of the month it is. I'll talk about like what the elk are doing, all these other things. So I can go back and look at it later. But um, I had a lot of like good film. I had a couple bears on film. I had a lot of elk on film. Um, and then finally the, the, finally the moment came where I, I had the camera with me. I had my, I had the Tacticam that year and I had the DSLR and I set the DSLR up and I had walked into this big herd of elk and I, I, was, I was chasing one bull in there. He was like 340 and he was running cows all over and there was like six other bulls. And I had, I didn't even call at that point. I was just, I set the camera up. I was right on the outside edge of this tree, um, tree line. And I, I set the camera up. I could zoom in and I, I could see a couple of cows walking around. And then I snuck up to the edge and I had the camera was up a little bit higher and it was, it was shooting over the top of me and it was good to go when I left that camera and it was recording. And then I, I laid there on the, in this little trail for almost like 20 minutes. And then finally I, I was tired. We're talking like day seven or day eight, I think, I think it was seven. And the elk had kind of pushed off away from me. And then all of a sudden I heard the big bull, he like screamed and he kicked this little bull right to me. And I was like, I looked back and the camera's recording. I was like, okay, sweet. And you could see the bull, you can see everything in the film. And I draw back and I was sitting there and he, it was steep. He turned right as I drew back and I couldn't, I had to hold for, 
I held for almost 90 seconds before I took the shot. And I, I hit him. He took like one step and then just fell over. I, he was dead like that. And um, then I looked, or right after I shot, I was like, oh crap, I forgot to turn the, the I forgot to turn the Tacticam on. So I turned that on really quickly and I catch him falling. And then I, I go back and I was like, I was all ecstatic because I got that, the, the DSLR was sitting there, was watching the whole thing. And then I went back and I played the film while well, I forgot to turn the autofocus on. So the whole thing is blurry. And then you see me draw back and I'm holding and it gets to like, it gets to like 80 seconds of me in full draw. And then the cam DSLR is like, they stop recording after like 25 minutes. Yep. I hit 25 minutes before I sent the arrow. So not only is it blurry, you, you don't even see me send the arrow. And I was just like, Oh man. I was so happy there's that I got it all. Limit. There's a weird it, time it, limit on it. I don't know what that's all about. I, I don't know either. I think it's just a battery situation, but I mean, I was so happy. I had like all, all of that stuff on film, like bulls are screaming left and right. And then, and then, uh, then you go back to watch the film and you're just like, ah, oh, man, like what in the world? So it, it's some of those things that you, you got to learn. You got to remember these things. The autofocus itself would have helped me a ton. It would have been able to like pick things up. But I mean, you live and le you learn at that point. So yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, let's, okay. So that's self filming. I think um, you're talking about some of the equipment. Tripods are important, obviously, because you're going to be setting that camera somewhere, right? I mean, you're going to be putting yeah. cameras up and if you have a tripod or something to set it on, it becomes a, just a whole nother platform to put it on. Yeah. You want to go a for little, weight and, and durability yeah. at that point on those two. So, cause you're, you're, I, when I'm doing self filming, I usually pack two of them because sometimes I'll want to pack up the, the phone or, or I'll set the GoPro on one. I'll set the, the other camera on the other one, but yeah. Yeah, and we will, yeah. I don't want to get into lenses and I don't want to dive into all of that stuff because there's plenty of other podcasts out there about camera setups. Um, right. I just, I think it's important to kind of understand that self filming is difficult, first of all. So I've <laughs> never yes. done it. I really like Jeff's idea of trying to practice doing that. Take your stuff to the range, right. mount it on your body, put it somewhere where you can use it and you can practice with, with the equipment. And that's important. Right. Um, so for full draw, you didn't self film when you did that film. How did that go down? Tell us about that. That, that was a new experience for me. So like getting in front of a camera or talking to people, that's not a big deal. But when it comes to a cameraman, um, I hunt in some pretty rough, rugged terrain and it's, we get stuck in some like really weird situations and, and really difficult situations. Kind of like, well, how did I get here? Like, this isn't safe. And having a cameraman around at all times, you're, I, especially where I go, I, I felt like obligated to, to make sure he was okay and make sure that we, make sure the camera was on sometimes and, and looking back and trying to make sure you didn't get too far ahead and make sure that, that we stopped and like took breaks to make sure the batteries were going you have to carry one of the things I guess I should have mentioned with self filming is making sure that you have like a, um, uh, solar chargers and like extra battery packs because all of a sudden you're, you're running through two or three batteries in a day trying to, to get everything on film and captured and, and your the pack weight increases significantly at that point. Um, and so you, you, you have, depending on the situation that you're in or depending on anything else that the cameraman, he's got to change out lenses and, and, um, and make sure everything is like focusing. Uh, we had to carry a mic sometimes. So I had to have like an external mic that would connect. And if you get too far ahead, then you're not going to be able to pick up the sound quality correctly, which that makes a whole new challenge. Um, and so we, we did some of this stuff and this was, a, I didn't get to practice any of that stuff. And, going into it, I just wasn't, especially elk hunting, um, or any, actually anything, just trying to get in range of that animal and still be able to like, get it all on film. You got to sneak two people in instead of one. Um, we had the bull that I actually shot. I had blown the stock on him the night before trying to make sure that I could get the cameraman and me back like in, into the herd and, and get a, 
get some calls off in time. And I, I couldn't, he like picked up his calves and took off. And I thought he was little actually, and he's not very little. Um, <laughs> and we had no idea how big he was. We just knew he was bugling and he sounded really weak. And, um, so we, we blew the stock on him that night. And then I blew the stock on him the next morning, trying to get the cameraman, like, me and the cameraman were in place and I was trying to move and he's like trying to like holler at me to tell me that the cows were like watching and, and we didn't get very much of that stuff on film and, and trying to make sure that everything is like, especially when your cameraman's also like a hunt, he didn't have a tag, but he's a hunter. So he's like super excited about what's going on. And, um, it, it made for an interesting deal. Um, usually I just put myself through misery and now I got to put through a cameraman through misery and make sure that he's like taking the, the video and the photos that he needs to. And it, uh, <clears throat> did he have was, experience as a cameraman? Yes. So he, he, they got their, um, both, he's one of my business partners, um, Caleb and both of them kind of got their start with filming for, I think it's called Infinity Outdoors. They did a lot of goose and waterfowl hunting, um, which is not the same as big game hunting, but they they still were able to to get started. And he had actually filmed a couple, actually the month before uh, in mid-August, and you could see this on our YouTube channel, but he dropped the 197-inch mule deer buck on opening day with, on camera. So they had the camera on them. Um, they he's a He's a big big mule deer buck he's not very wide but he's like a six by eight or something like that hmm. um full velvet and they they dropped him all on camera which was cool um so they they've they've done the self-filming thing before but he had never elk hunted before so this was a whole new experience with him and i'm not the easiest person in the world to hunt with um <laughs> i i uh i i'm one of those guys that like it could be getting dark and i want to know what's over like the ridge like three ridges over and then I get, we get stuck in the dark and trying to climb out and not know where we're at. And, and so it was a new experience for him. Um, but he did have some, he did have experience like filming. So that, that was a positive thing. And he's able to capture the angles and making sure that everything was, was right. And the one thing that's always hard is he wants to, <clears throat> I guess the one thing that was difficult is, is us as hunters, we we want to be able to move on the animal. We, we know something's going on and we want to make sure that we take off and we get there on time and everything else. Well, you got to sit there and talk to the camera and let the camera know what's going on and, and what you're trying to do and moving into this, this direction or that direction and what the animals are doing. You're trying to talk through the whole process, which is difficult. I mean, you could do the voiceover to it later, but it doesn't give you the same feel as if you're able to do it on camera during the actual moment because then you capture then you capture like the adrenaline you capture the 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 voice and the tones of defeat or failure <laughs> yeah. um and and so it's 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 not easy to be able to produce some of those films um to be able to submit them to full draw or to be able to submit them to anything really so that's why you see so many of the, the youtube films are you're at the beginning stages and it's hard. I know if, if those guys didn't have the experience that they did and the knowledge that they did in the cameras, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have captured everything like we needed to. So that I have to hats off to those guys to be able to, to put this on film. And I, we've been trying to capture my like disaster of hunting season for years and kind of the <laughs> stuff that I, I put myself through a lot of rough stuff. And um, at one point in time, Caleb, my cameraman, we've told this several times, but we were like packing out and I, I, I took him up the side of this cliff and it's not, it was bad. It was dumb, but it's just what happens when you hunt with me. And uh, he looks over, he's like, dude, if, if our moms knew that we were doing something like this, like, <laughs> it, and at that point you're, you're in such a rough spot. You can't have the cameras out. So it's just kind of like all for yourself and hopefully you make it out sort of a thing. Yeah. And so that's, <clears throat> and then trying to, to make sure that you get situated after and make sure you have the cameras on and you're not missing things. Cause we did miss some stuff that I wish we were, was on film, but it's kind of, it happens. It's always going to happen that way. So. Yeah. Always. There's always going to be that moment that doesn't quite get captured. Yeah. Luckily we got the shot. The shot's the biggest one and trying to get it, trying to get like in position to make sure that the camera is 
and, and it's really hard. A lot of people want to get the shot where it's over the top of the hunter and you get the animal on film and that's the possibilities of that actually happening are, are slim to none. Yeah. When it does happen, like kudos to you guys, but yeah. um, get the release <laughs> of the arrow and slow-mo yep. the arrow flying, you know, yeah, that's that. One. Well, so, and that's, that's something that we messed up this year too, is we, we didn't have the, um, the frames per second on the camera weren't high enough when I shot. And so you can't, you couldn't do a slow-mo. Now you see blood go everywhere still. And you see the arrow come in from the left side, but it's, uh, yeah, so trying to remember all of these things that take place, even as a cameraman, he's been doing it for years. It's like, it's still in the heat of battle and your, your adrenaline's going too. And Yeah. Yeah, you, and I can you almost, wish that all happens. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that everybody, I haven't seen the, the film yet, but I can guarantee you that everybody that watches it is going to think that it's awesome. And oh, yeah. I think that you and, and your camera guys are probably being a little too critical because you might have missed that that perfect over the shoulder shot but whatever you you got the shot on film and it's gonna be it's gonna be great like i know and this is totally different but i know like with these podcasts i'm super critical of myself and oh yeah nobody listens nobody's on here to listen to me i don't know why i'm critical of myself you know but that's just I'm the way gonna... it is i think you want to <clears throat> i mean yeah I, I know how it is you, you always want to make sure you ask the right questions and everything like that but yeah he actually so... he actually helped me during the shot because I, I it was a frontal shot I'll give you guys that um uh -huh. which is sketchy on a on an animal a lot of well not sketchy like I feel comfortable with it I've taken it many times and um but that the bull I had actually I'd actually kicked his cows and he was staring right at the cameraman he had no idea I was there and so if it wasn't for the cameraman he probably would have caught me and I wouldn't have been able to take the shot so I got lucky on that part, which, which was great because he's staring right into the camera and uh, I'll take it all day. But it was, it, it was interesting that when we went back and watched it all on film, I didn't, I knew that it was a good shot. But then when we looked at it on film, it was like, Oh, that's awesome. Like, I'm, yeah. it was, it was pretty cool. And it, it's not as steady as you would like because we didn't have, um, we didn't Auto have the image stabilization. Yeah. You're right. Well, so and the reason for that, and these are these are things that you learn, is uh, auto stabilization sometimes can make noise when you're on the camera, and then you it's really difficult to <clears throat> it's really difficult to like edit it out. And so he was he was trying to hold it focus and and zoom in and make sure everything was on because he's doing everything in manual, not auto. And uh, yeah, so it but it's still. We're able to zoom way in. You'll you'll be able to see the shot and the arrow and everything else on camera. It's it's kind of a it's a cool scene. I was so let me let me ask you this, and then this is just kind of a tangent, little side question. But were your camera guys calling for you? Do you use no. them for that? So they're just <clears throat> filming and pictures, and that's it. Right. So I mean, I wish, but Caleb and Mike, both the camera guys, like they've never called elk before, and to be honest with you i haven't i haven't shot a bull that i called in in a couple of years like i've called bulls in and then just not taking the shot because i didn't i didn't want that one or something like that and so and that was the case with him is i had actually pushed him when i tried to call and so finally the third time when i when i took the shot we actually snuck into the herd and it was him and 27 cows that was it so there's a lot of eyes running around yeah he was yeah. in the mountain good yeah. for him uh, <laughs> yeah right lucky uh, that's lucky bull right there yeah he was well he was having some luck um but it was uh <clears throat> he wasn't calling and and i think part of that was i didn't want him to call even if he was really good at it because we wanted to capture the fact that i go into this place by myself every year we wanted to capture the pack out if i could get one down we wanted to capture like the the frustration like on my face because it, it never happens right away and it, it always takes a long time and and um we wanted to capture like the idea of like self-calling and everything i've mm -hmm. actually never taken a shot on a bull that was under 40 yards because i don't have a caller and most people don't think about that but you usually have a caller back behind you 20 30 yards and it's going to bring the animal way closer mm -hmm. and i don't I haven't had that luck yet. Most of my shots have been on animals 
between 40 and 65 yards. So it was a matter of if actually capturing what I go through and not trying to capture something that, that would be, uh, if you were hunting with more than one person, I guess, especially for elk. So yeah, that's a cool way to do it. I think that's good. Yeah. We, um, we wanted to capture my misery the best we could. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the submission into a film tour. You guys, so you, you're, you've already, you've gone out, you've <clears> done all the filming, you've done all the uh, pictures, you've done all the stuff, editing. That's a whole nother beast. I don't, we'll kind of touch on editing a little bit, but let's just talk right. about how do you get that film to a tour and how do you submit it? So, you know, that's, that might be even more of like a, a difficult task than the actual filming it, filming the actual hunt itself. Because when you go into these film tours and you're looking for these film tours, they have guidelines on the length that the film can be. They have guidelines on um, the quality they want. They want the film in certain um, resolutions and certain frames per second and everything. And so you have to look at all these guidelines and then you, when you're doing your editing, you have to make sure that everything is going to line up and being able to capture the actual experience and, and the full, um, I guess the, the full feeling and, and what you're trying to produce on film in a shorter version film. Cause I full draw was our submission this year. And they told us, they told us about 11 minutes and we have hours of film. And so when you're going through that process, you're like, okay, we can use this video. We can use this clip. We can use this clip. And the next thing you know, you have like a 25 minute film and you're like, Oh man, how are we going to cut this down? <laughs> That's way over 11 minutes. Yeah. 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 And, and, and uh, I get why they do it because you, you want to capture the attention of your audience right away. And it's just, it's kind of like sales almost. You, you want to make sure that right from the get go, somebody is interested in what you have to say and what you're doing and the whole process of, of what you're going to about to show them. And, but you have to do it in a very quick time frame because if you draw it out too long or there's not a good enough like story or the footage isn't all there, then people aren't going to be interested. They're not going to be able to like capture it all in They're They're going to lose interest. And, um, so being able to cut out the right clips and make sure that you, you can tell the story that you want to in a very short time frame, And I mean, we're talking the idea of cutting out simple words that I say regularly while I'm talking, I say, um, a lot. And we had to sit there and we had to chop those out of the segments because it's like all of them together add up to an extra minute and trying to, to tell the right story and, and get the music right and everything. It's <clears throat> you, it's difficult on that end. And, and that doesn't even get into some of the, the, the fancy stuff like color, color coding and everything. Um, the, the, when you go into the film tours too, you're, they want to do like a rough draft. So they're going to take a look at your film and they're going to look at kind of everything as a whole before you actually have to submit the final edition. Now, some guys will go through the whole process and make the final edition, the final cuts and submit it as a whole. But I think we took the route that we wanted to tell the basic backdrop of the film and show what we had on film and the quality of content that we had and hope that we got in. Like it was just kind of a fingers crossed. We felt like it was good enough film, but it, it wasn't there yet. So, um, Luckily, we got we got the email in March at some point. I think it was in March, yeah. And said, "Hey, you've been accepted. Now you have you have 30 days to send us the full edit, and you also have oh, by the way, you got like you have to make a trailer for us, a one minute trailer, and it's got it's got to be done in like five days. It's like oh, okay. So now we got to go in and we got to edit and we got to cut this. Now we got to cut 11 minutes down to one minute, and it's just like uh, okay, so." Um, <clears throat> finding the right film tours. And then you also have to understand that like a lot of the content is, is when you're, when you're giving your film to a tour, um, you're not allowed to show that stuff at all. You can't talk about it. You can't show it. You can't produce any of the content on YouTube, social media, or any of that sort of stuff because they technically own the rights to your film. And so you have to be willing to accept the fact that, well, and this year has been a little bit rough because the film tour should have started in May and this whole COVID thing is, has 
has made the, the film tour, we've had to make some adjustments. And so we haven't gotten the exposure and everything. And you have to kind of take one for the team at that point. But yeah, um, and we're going to touch on that in a minute because they're, they're kind of redoing, they're changing right. the way that they're going to do full draw film. Too. Well, well, shoot, let's just do it right now, right? Let's talk That's about fine. it. How are they going to, <clears throat> what's the change? Last year, you used to be able to go to a theater and they had reserved theaters and you'd go in and you'd sit down. Right. Not this year. And no. So they, that was the plan. They had all their stops lined up and then, then uh, with the virus, they had to shut everything down. And then they, as things started to open back up again, they, he did a ton of work and I feel bad because you know, we, we submitted the films and it was, it's great. And you don't want to be selfish by any means because it's not out there yet, but they did a ton of work to, to launch a second version of the film tour that they were going to start July 9th. So in about a week and they, they had like 35 stops instead of 65 and they were going to split off into two groups. And then, then lo and behold, now some of the states are shutting back down again and they're throwing fits. They say you can't have it in, in a, in a theater. And so they're just going to, they, they canceled everything. They canceled all the tour dates and everything. And what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to break all. So there's eight films in this year's one film. Um, and they're going to break it off into segments of two films. And they're, they're going to, I think they're going to do a four night event. I'm not hundred percent positive, but it will be like an online event where everybody can watch it. And it'll be published. Um, they're still going to do the big giveaways because Full Drop Film Tour is known for the giveaways that they give the people when you go into the theater. Um, mm -hmm. Like your ticket, your ticket counts towards winning a new bow or winning coolers or anything like that. And so they're going to do all that stuff online this year. And I think it'll be good for them because it's going to branch some of the exposure to people that have never been able to see it before. Um, and even go into like he said he's gotten some interest from people in Canada before and they just have never been able to make it up there where this is all going to be hosted online. Um, I think there's going to be, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but we talked about doing like a live Q and a after the film. So people will be able to ask me questions. They'll be able to ask my cameraman questions and, and stuff like that, which will be really cool because it gives us a lot more. A, I think that's a really cool idea. Yeah, I, I do too. And I mean, my film is a little bit different where we told, we, we didn't tell the, the, the backdrop of the story of the hunt so much as we did some other stuff and that happened. Um, and so there's going to be people going to ask a, a handful of different questions. I know I'm going to get asked questions on the shot and the distance and how I felt comfortable with that and everything else. So it, I, I think it's good because then, then people, because people always have questions and that's why we're doing this podcast because when you get into the whole self filming thing, like that's a, that's a whole new ball game. And so being <laughs> yeah. able to, to actually answer those questions for people and, and they can do it. And I think, <clears throat> I think we'll probably host a, an online Q and a afterwards too, because I think they're going to cut the Q and a probably down to 20 or 30 minutes and that's not going to be, enough time for everybody so no and then <clears throat> i don't know when when we'll be able to release it online i it, it was supposed to be the end of august but um i think it'll still stay the same so we'll release we're actually going to release a full version so it'll be instead of 11 minutes it'll probably be like 20 minutes um and it gives you a little bit more of the the misery that we went through so yeah <laughs> it, it was it was a lot um the pack out was the roughest part so as always it always is, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. I think, so there's a lot of changes coming. I think all of these things are going to change. I was, I was another thing that changed dramatically this year that everybody looks forward to is the total archery challenge and some of these big 3D right. shoots. And those things are changed. I know they kind of kicked them up a little bit, but things well, are we different. Have a... I, I'm glad that people have the ingenuity i guess or just whatever the ability to think outside of the box and not just say well full draws canceled this year we're not going to do this film tour because people can't go to the theaters um, i think it's really awesome that they're going to be able to put that out on an online platform and still be able to still be able to release it that's really good i think that's i think it'll be a good timing too because everybody's still getting ready for hunting season and and um everything has been shutting down again for, I mean, Arizona, I was just in Arizona and we just shut down or they just shut down Arizona for another 30 days or something like that. So people are going to be like pent up. They're, they're ready. It, it, 
they're ready to get out there and hunt and, and get going. And that's just going to get your blood boiling at that point. So we're excited about it. Yeah. Um, I know. Is, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. I actually, I actually got to go start scouting on my hunt. I think next weekend I'm going to take off and back, back into Wyoming. So that should be fun. I'm excited. That will be fun. So really <laughs> quick. Um, let's talk about what you got planned for this year. I'm actually, I'm going to let you talk about what you got planned and I'm going to go close my blinds. Cause I got this thing coming in on me. Yeah. It looks a little rough on you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, coming, it's, a, it's been coming across like this the whole time we've been talking. So let's talk about yeah, what you got. I'll still be here. I, my cords will reach, but um, yeah, let's fine. talk about what you're doing this year. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> as a team, as a, as a company, I think we have several hunts. We were fortunate enough to have, um, we have five guys on the team. One guy, he's an outfitter, and um, we don't do a whole lot as far as the filming for him. But my team, has their, they have um, draw tags in Utah, which is actually the same tag that uh, they killed. They put that 197-inch mill deer down. So there's going to be three guys out there for that one in early August. I think they are headed out to start like August 10th. And then I was fortunate enough to draw a Wyoming tag, which actually it's <clears throat> my biggest thing is I'm an over the counter guy. And I, I try not to go on these like big, well, it's not try. I just don't want to go on these big, like guided hunts or anything like that. I, I, I want to put myself through everything that, that everybody else does. Um, I would prefer over the counter tags most of the time. Um, and so I have a general tag in Wyoming, but there's a bull that, that we've been watching in there um, for several years that he's, he's very large. So it's a go big or go home for us. We're, we're going to take a cameraman in there. We're going to start filming. We're going to start filming soon. We're going to do everything from nutrition, um, how I prep, um, what kind of food I take in, because most people never take in enough food. And that's kind of an interesting concept. Um, we did the calculations and everything last year and I burn about 9,000 calories a day. Oh. So if you're, if you're only eating two or 3,000, of course you get tired after two or three days and your brain gets tired. It is a mental game and uh, just as much as it is a physical game. And so um, making sure that you're like caught up with your food and everything is, is a big deal. So we're going to film all of that stuff this year, everything from workouts to nutrition to, um, and this is going to sound funny, but when you go into a hunt like that and I'm going to backpack in for anywhere from five to 30 days, we're going after one animal. Um, you have to practice eating that much too, which some guys are like, Oh yeah, I could, I could do that. But for me to jump it up from like 3,500 calories a day to like 8,000 calories a day, like that's hard. You can't just do that overnight. And so we, <clears throat> all of that stuff, we're going to try and capture that on film this year going into my Wyoming hunt. And then, um, one of our team guys, he drew a, uh, one of our team guys, he, him and his son actually drew, his son has never hunted elk. Um, so his son, they drew a, actually a really good bull tag in Idaho, which we're going to go film that in October. So we're stoked about that. We should be able to put out some really good films this year. Um, and especially, especially when you get the younger generation out and you get that whole emotional, cause I mean, nowadays I don't get super emotional when I take a shot. Um, but man, you get, you get the kids out there. That's, that's fun. This should be a good one. Um, yeah, that's good. And I think we have, I think we have one November tag. I don't remember too much, but we're, we're excited about the seat. We're excited about the, the company. We've grown quite a bit this last year. Um, actually it's, yeah, it's grown quite, quite a bit. And, uh, despite the whole COVID thing. And so for us to be able to produce a bunch more films, and I think we're going to try and submit one or two films again this year. So we're, we have to step it up a little bit and, and we increase some of the lenses that we had and, and going to go back into the whole filming thing. And, and my Wyoming trip is actually going to be on horseback. So that's, that's going to add something new to the game, mm -hmm. which we haven't done before. So it's, uh, uh, it, it should be fun. So we have a good season coming up and it's coming up quick. It's shoot. It's already what July 1st. So. Yep. It's coming up. It's kind of real. <laughs> I need to get my bow out, man. We were talking about this before the podcast. I said, shoot, I was shooting a bunch back in San Antonio. And then I moved out here to Albuquerque and I just been life yeah. gets in the way, man. And so it's time to buckle down and wake up a little bit earlier or go to bed a little bit later and spend some time with the bow. And 
And, well, we got an archery shoot. I think the, it's on the 18th of July on Lake Tahoe, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the first, first time the Lake Tahoe's ever allowed like a hunting event there. And of course it comes in this really weird year. Um, and they have all sorts of weird restrictions. I, I'm not wearing a mask on the course, but other than that, I think that we have to wear a mask all the time. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to go in, we're going to do, we're going to film some commercials and stuff like that. But I, I, yeah, like, like you said, my bow is just sitting there. It hasn't even, I don't have anything even attached to it. It's just a bare bow right at the moment. Um, the, it, I mean, it looks pretty, but the, <laughs> I, gotta I think that that's reality, though. Going. You know, I think that's reality. Yeah, so you see that small portion of guys that are on the the social media, whatever, and they're they're shooting in January, hundred arrows a day, right? And there's a small oh, yeah. group of people that are like that, but there's a there's a good group of people that are like me and you that have their <laughs> mine's in the garage, my bow's in behind a bunch of boxes because I just moved, and right. priorities are priorities, right? It's coming out you know, this week, I, though. It's actually <laughs> probably when we get off of this thing, my motivation is going to be grab the bow and the target, and I'm going to shoot in the morning. So nice. The uh, and when you say that, that whole like, there's there's a small group of or not even necessarily a small group of us. It's just life is kind of there. I <clears throat> I've actually been talking about that a lot lately with people that are saying, oh, you don't have to go to the gym and you don't need to be in like great shape to go hunting and everything. You just need to make sure you go to the mountains and hike. It's like, well sometimes we don't have time for that and Mm -hmm. putting putting a setting aside an hour to go work out in the garage or or something is sometimes what you have to do and uh, yeah i would love to be out in the mountains and and you don't have to be in tremendous shape to to go out and hunt some of these areas but to um to make sure that you put in the time and the effort and you might not i mean you got to spend time with your kids and your family and everything else you can't just ditch and go up to the mountains every single weekend mm-hmm. and make sure you get into hiking and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's yeah, what I think it's, it's really easy for people to say, you don't need to be in the gym, just go to the mountains and hike. Half of the United States doesn't have mountains. <laughs> I used to live in Florida for five years. We didn't have, <laughs> right. like, if I wanted to climb up a hill, I had to like get on the freeway and take the little on-ramp or something like that. Exactly. There was no I, I lived in San Antonio and I didn't have mountains. I had hill country. You know, my house was at 600 feet elevation and out in the hill country of Texas, you might get to 1200. I can't remember what it is, but yeah. So it's important for people. Like, I I think you're right. You need to find those gyms. You need to do all that. And um, Andrew and I from dark mountain, we and, and Steve Morgado, we've all had these conversations many, many times. Like what is, what do you have to do if you, live in that 600 feet elevation and you don't have mountains what's important right and you know that lower body is important those shoulders lower body are important your, i i think it comes down to your your shoulders your core and and the lower body um mm-hmm. and to making making sure that you're not heavier than you should be um mm-hmm. that's a big thing because i talk to people all the time they're like man i threw on a 20 pound weighted vest and i went and did the the uh Oh, what's the Memorial Day run? Why am I not? I'm drawing a blank here. I don't know. They they talk about throwing on a 20 pound weighted vest, and you're like, man, I just feel so much heavier, and it, it that makes such a huge difference. It's like, well, if you're 20 pounds overweight when you go onto the mountain, that's that's what it's like. It's it's yeah. rough. So, yeah. um, so and I actually I preach it a, a little bit different too because if if you can take the time and you can make sure to focus on on your food and your nutrition and making sure to get in the, the gym or something like that, like three, four days a week. That's a, that's a big mental hurdle. Mm-hmm. And it, it may not come down to your physical abilities at the end of it when it's all said and done or, or when that moment comes in, it's, it's whether you're mentally like prepared for what you're trying to put yourself through. And so if you can have those little mental wins as you go along, it, what, even, even just working out, like that's a, every single time you go to the gym, it becomes more of a habit and, it's a mental win and a mental win and a mental win. And you become, you become mentally stronger when you get out there too. So it's not always, it's not always the physical side. Um, mm-hmm. And, and if you put all of the, if you put all the puzzle pieces together, uh, hopefully it all turns out um, and you can go farther and you feel better about yourself. And that whole accomplishment is, is that much greater. So I, I, I try to strain or push that, that process of the mental side of it just as much because 
that you become more mentally tough when you can be disciplined to be able to do all the other stuff that you need to do leading up to the season, whether it be practice mm -hmm. or anything else. Yeah. And do you guys have anything like that on your website that kind of prepping for that mental game, prepping for the <clears throat> mental challenges? Um, you know, we probably should do a little bit more content like that. And we, we haven't the, I preach the concept of it, but we don't, we haven't, I should probably write an article about that. So I appreciate it um, because it is important. You to actually consider it. Yeah, you did. So because, stay well, tuned. There's an article coming so soon from built for the hunt. It, it will, it, it will <laughs> come out. I'm, I'm going to do this now. So I appreciate it. But the, like, to me, I just think of it that way is it, it's just in the back of my mind that, you know, what, every time that I meal prep for the week, like that's a win. And every time I, I, like when I don't feel like going to the gym and then I go grind it out in the gym anyway, it's like, that's a win mentally. And most people don't realize it, but yeah, that is a concept that probably needs to be discussed a little bit more. And yeah. um, it's, it, the it's same in the concept. back of my mind, but yeah, it's that same concept that tells you I only, I 200 more feet and I'll be at the top of this ridge line, Right. Right. It's that same push. It's that same desire to get you there, that same dedication and determination. So, so you get to that 200 feet and there's another 200 on top of it. Like, <laughs> Every oh, time, right? It. Every <laughs> single time. Every Where does time. it come from? <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, hey, man, let's, uh, I think we'll wrap it up. We're hitting close to the hour mark. Uh, awesome. I, told, I truly appreciate your time and coming on. Um, where can everybody find you? You know, the normal contact info. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, as far as the company goes, it's built for the hunt with the number four. So I, I don't think we touched on that. So um, you can go to builtforthehunt.com. Um, YouTube is going to be built for the hunt. Make sure to, to subscribe over to that. I know we have some turkey films coming out and then we'll have the elk film coming out too. Um, as well as gear guides and some nutrition stuff before the hunting season. So we got a, a full schedule lined up right before the go here. Um, Instagram, Facebook is built for the hunt. As far as like me personally, it's, it's relentless hunter with the hunter is just H N T R. So drop the U drop the E and, and that's it there. So you can follow along on my stories. It's not as much, eh, a lot of it's, it's not as much company stuff there. It's more of my personal stuff. And then um, if you go follow the company, we, we release all of the giveaways. We do, um, films, giveaways, uh, extra content. We ask poll questions, all that sort of stuff. We try and get people involved as much as we can. And then we do have uh, <clears throat> our big our big products and everything right now. I think we're doing a lot of like weighted vests and sandbag training, um, which is big going into the hunting season. That's Everybody's trying to do the endurance thing and drop a few pounds. So yeah, yeah you can find us. I think you, yeah, you can find us at, at all those things just built for the hunt with the number four and then my personal one. So okay and i'll link all that stuff in if if people awesome. want to go to your website what do they find on there like what all, what's all your products that you guys sell not necessarily by brand name but you know supplements protein powders yeah so so our biggest um it, the concept of it was being able to produce like an unbiased platform to sell like nutritional supplements um and also like work out like gear and apparel and products that can actually help you um, train for your hunts. So we don't have the sandbags up yet, but that'll be up here shortly. Uh, they're, they're the kind of sandbags you'll see in like train to hunt and everything else. Um, we do a, a weighted vests are a big deal because then you don't, especially if you're going to the gym and you don't have to throw it like, you're not the guy that drags in like a hundred pound pack <laughs> to the gym to get on a stair stepper. Yeah. Um, you can just throw, you can actually throw like a regular weight plate from that's there and throw it into the little vest and go step up on the stairs, the, the stair master for a little while. Um, but we do. Yeah. So it goes everything from training plans. We have a, a variety of training plans that are put together by different um, uh, train or trainers that we have hired next year. We're actually bringing in uh, custom plans so people can actually choose a trainer that they want to, and they're going to be able to sit down and they'll create a plan specifically for that person. You have a one-on-one, -on -one, like, deal with them um so we're excited about that coming in next year and then we do have we will have some nutrition guides i know we do we do add in you've had kyle camp on here uh, a couple times and he actually mm -hmm. writes for us because we want we didn't want to just like offer a bunch of fluff as far as like content and so he when it comes to nutrition i if you're not like a registered dietitian i don't want you writing for the company because i want to be able to produce like real like tested certified 
like stuff out there, not just something that some random person wrote. So Kyle has some good stuff on there about like eating the right amount of calories. Um, and that's all produced through the website. And there's a series of articles for that. And then we have, we have some random, um, like wild game recipes and stuff uh, that's going on there. I think we're going to do a cook off next year up in the Boise area. So it should be, awesome. it should be good. There, there's a ton of stuff on there. It's, it'll take you a little while. It's a, it's a huge undertaking. I think when we got it started, we weren't quite realizing what we were getting ourselves into, but it's, that's life. So yeah, well, it's working, man. Enough. And it's going, it's going really good for you guys. So yes. Yeah. So. Congratulations on everything over Thank there. You. I'll link, like I said, I'll link all your Instagram, social media website. I'll put it all in the description below and um, awesome. we'll get it all. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it too. So. Take it easy.